Hello, hello. Welcome, welcome. Um, if the rest of the panelists can please engage video, we're going to get started here. All right, everybody. This is CS Presents New Fast Glass Large Format Optical Considerations. Welcome. Uh, my name is Graham Ehlers Sheldon. A few items of business right off the top here. Of course, this is CS Presents, a series of uh, nearly weekly inspirational and, and educational webinars from creative professionals around the world. Ask questions by using the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Try to avoid putting it in chat. Try to use the Q&A button. If you're joining us on social platforms, we're going to try to gather everything in the Q&A form here, so don't worry about that. Thank you to Creative Solutions made up of Teradek, Small HD, and Wooden Camera, as well as Sigma Cine for their support of this stream. Don't forget to follow their social channels as well as the social channels of Duclos Lenses. Uh, if you're joining us on YouTube, please make sure to click subscribe on Teradek's channel for more content just like this. Before we start, I want to remind everyone about this event's giveaway. One lucky winner will be chosen at random to receive the fan favorite Sigma 18-35 f1.8 DCH SM art lens uh, in any available mount. Um, we'll reach out to the winner through the email address you used to register for this event. Make sure to check for an email from sigmaphoto.com. Please note your shipping address must be within the United States and you must be over 18 to win. Uh, again, you have to be registered to win. So if you're watching this on social media right now, you need to register through the event link. Maybe someone from the CS team can, can put that out there so everyone can find it. Now, you don't need to stay for the entire event to win. Once we have your email, you're already entered. But I like to think there's some good mojo to gain here that comes from staying for the full hour and learning about large format optics along with the rest of us. All right. So for this session, we're going to be diving to the ever-changing world of format sizes, specifically around large format optics, how large format affects your image, and why the professional world loves lenses that cover full frame. We'll also tackle why we make different lens choices as cinematographers, a bit of history, and we'll try to determine a common vocabulary with Matthew's help to define different optical characteristics and the history of uh, large format in general. In short, we're talking about modern cinema lenses. If you missed the CS Presents episode on vintage glass, I encourage you to check that one out on Teradex YouTube. Uh, you can just run a search for Secrets of Old Glass Part 1, and actually there's a Part 2 as well. Okay, uh, enough of that. We're very lucky to be joined by two leading industry professionals, Matthew Duclos of Duclos Lenses and film veteran Roy Wagner, ASC. I'm going to... Uh, give you a little bit of background on me, then I'm going to intro both of them, then we're going to hop right in. So uh, I'm Grammy Miller Sheldon. I'm a local 600 DP and PGA producer. Uh, I have a new feature doc film coming out on March 23rd called American Hussy. This doc follows a stand-up comedian from Alabama, Tushar Singh, uh, on a comedy tour across six cities in India. If you like comedy, if you like travel, then you're going to love this. It has uh, Russell Peters in it, Bill Burr. It's going to be available everywhere digitally on March 23rd. Check it out. Okay, so everyone, Matthew, hello. Uh, a lens technician by trade, Matthew Duclos has been servicing, repairing, and modifying cinema lenses for over 25 years. His career began as an apprentice under the guidance of his father, Paul Duclos. A passion and technical aptitude for optical and mechanical design has led to a lifelong obsession with cinema lenses. Matthew continues exploring lenses of all kinds, consulting for a variety of lens manufacturers around the world. He's an associate member of the ASC uh, and SOC, Matthew strives to share his knowledge and experience with the motion picture industry as a whole, which I, I think one of the reasons why he's here today. So hello, Matthew, how are you doing? I'm good, how are you? Not, uh, not too bad. Um, and then of course, Roy Wagner, ASC. Roy is an American cinematographer known for dramatic dark imagery, named by Kodak as one of the top 100 directors of photography in the world. Wagner's career has spanned 35 years in the motion picture and television industries. He's also received the ASC Award for Outstanding Achievement in Cinematography for a miniseries and is a two-time Primetime Emmy Award nominee. And we're going to be talking a little bit about one of his more recent uh, feature stand. Sorry, Roy, didn't mean to cut you off. Good. No, it's a, I've won twice for, for pilots. Okay, so he's won twice. Congratulations. <laughs> All right, so before we jump in here, I thought it was important that we kind of set the stage, explore some of the vocabulary that we're gonna talk about. Because uh, Matthew, you know, I went 
through the internet last night thinking, what do people think large format is? And the answer is nobody seems to know or have a common understanding. And there's just, everyone's all over the map. So, you know, I, I mentioned to this, this to you on a previous uh, conversation we had that I, in my head, it's sort of like you have a 35 millimeter, you're four feet from your subject. It's easier to throw your background out of focus. Whereas on a, a S35, the background might not be as soft. Um, I mean, is that an oversimplification? Are there some common things we can say here about large format? What do you think? Uh, yeah, that's a pretty simple way of putting it. And you're definitely not wrong there. Um, but there's so many other little things to consider. It's not just the format you're shooting. Um, you know, when you, when you talk about that depth of field and how shallow or not shallow it is, uh, not only are you talking about your focal length, but you're also referring to your focus distance, which is really what's going to give you that specific depth of field. So uh, yes, it's, it's extremely misunderstood in a lot of cases as far as what to expect and what people are actually looking for, um, which hopefully we can dive into much deeper today. Why do you think it is, honestly, this topic is so misunderstood? Is it because we don't have industry standards necessarily? Why do you think that is? There just seems to be a lot of misconceptions out there because to some extent, large format holdover from medium format photography. I mean, DSLRs from like a decade ago were large format. Why is it such a vogue thing now to be talking about? Um, I think we could probably thank a combination of red and airy for this, uh, for the most part, wild west. Um, red kind of shook things up when they started using Super 35 and making it just a little bit bigger, maybe a little wider and a little shorter. Uh, and they kind of threw the Super 35 standard uh, that we've all known for from the film days out the window. Um, and they just called it Super 35, which is fine. I have no problem with that. Um, and then we can, you know, give a little credit to Aerie as well, because they came out with their Alexa LF and kind of gave a name to that format as far as cinematography goes um, in, a, in a modern era. Going back to film days, VistaVision was essentially the same thing as full frame. It was the exact same film, just turned 90 degrees. Um, but once Aerie started calling their full frame, their 24 by 36 ish size sensor, large format, it kind of threw people through a loop. They didn't really know, you know, you think of medium format and you think of this massive sensor, these digital backs and huge film, but going to large format, you'd think, okay, that must be bigger than medium, right? But it's not. For cinematography, large format is still smaller than medium format, but still bigger than something like Super 35. So it, it comes down to, um, you know, semantics really, and what we call something given the, the specific field that we're referring to it in. But large format has really just sort of become a catch-all, in my opinion, for anything, uh, again, clarifying for cinematography, not for still photography. But in cinematography, large format has really just become a catch-all for anything bigger than Super 35, but smaller than, you know, still formats, medium size. We don't really have anything in cinematography aside from Alexa 65. Um, so it's just sort of this wild west where LF and large format have just become a, a catch-all. Gotcha. Well, I think now might be a good time, Matthew, if you're okay with it. Michael, if you don't mind, let's get the couple slides. There's just two slides here that Matthew created for this presentation. Just breaks down sensor size versus resolution. You might go into crop, I'm not sure. But Matthew, I'll let you take it away here for a few minutes and I'll be quiet. Sure. So I wanted to get this sort of out of the way first, just so that we're all on the same page and we're referring to the same things here. So the point of this particular slide, some of these were borrowed from a, a previous presentation I had given. Um, so they're a little out of context, but what we're really showing here is these three sensors are all 8K. They have the exact same resolution. They have the exact same number of pixels up and down side to side, whatever. 8,192 by 4,320. And yet they're completely different sized sensors. So the top two are the same camera, if you know how Red and Panavision sort of did their whole arrangement. Um, those are a, what I would consider large format or full frame motion picture, or even VistaVision, if you ask Red, um, format. And then you have the 8K helium sensor, 
which is the exact same resolution, but it's a much smaller format. So the purpose of this is really to make sure that everybody is on the same page as far as the difference between a resolution and a format. Um, and then go to the next slide. The next slide is going to be showing, there we go. So this is the, the exact opposite of that. These are all almost identical sizes. Everybody would agree that these are considered full frame, large format, Vista Vision. They're all the same. Like I said, they, they get lumped into that same category. These are all large format sensors. The Red Monstro, Alexa LF, Sony Venice, Sigma FP, they vary slightly in size, very slightly. So if you look at the, the dimensions below the resolution, you know, the Monstro is 40 by 21 and 36 by 25, 36 by 24. They're about the same, give or take a millimeter here or there. But these are all large format. And yet, one of them is 8K, one of them is 4.5K, one of them is 6K, one of them is 4K. One of them could be 12K is a discussion we were having recently as well. The resolution in this case does not matter uh, as far as the look that we're, we're talking about here, the, the depth of field and how we're framing the angle of view. It does not matter what resolution you're talking about. These, the features that I wanted to make clear were grounded in physics, which are not changing in the case of these resolutions. Um, so that's the end of my soapbox uh and then we'll we'll take it from there great yeah and just um everyone keep your questions coming i just want to make it clear too that if you are an advanced user if you're sort of just now coming into the world of full frame all questions are on the table there's no dumb questions here just want to throw that out there right at the top if at any point you feel like we're not making something clear enough just please hit us up uh, in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or in the uh, comments section of whatever platform you're on. So then Matthew, this brings us to being able to cover these sensor sizes from the lens perspective. So mm -hmm. um, Michael, I think you can, you can lose that slide now. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, optics right now, I mean, there's a few different buzzwords covering full frame being one of those uh, resolving 4K. I mean, there's all sorts of things that one could argue are more on the marketing side of things than, <laughs> than anything else. But what are we talking about when we say that the lens is able to cover a full frame sensor? That just means without vignetting? What does that mean exactly? And then, and then what size sensor? Because it might be able to cover some full frame, but not all the way up to a Monstro or a 65. You so you kind of nailed it there a second ago when you said that some of it's just marketing. Um, and that's exactly right. There's a couple lens manufacturers that when 4K first became the new big thing after HD, they branded their lenses 4K capable or 4K compatible, um, which in and of itself is a bit of a misleading uh, promotion because they didn't specify what exactly that means. Are they talking about 4K resolving power? And if so, again, going back to the discussion we had recently about the resolution and the format, let's say you have a 12K Blackmagic camera. That sensor is only super 35. So yeah, you're gonna be able to resolve that on most lenses. If you cram that same resolution down to like a two thirds inch sensor or even micro four thirds, that becomes vastly more challenging to resolve. So I won't go too deep down that rabbit hole, but the fact that the manufacturers didn't specify 4K at this size is automatically misleading. Um, the other problem with it is they shot themselves in the foot. They thought 4K is gonna be here for five or 10 years and now we've got 12K, 8K, everything. Um, and that does not mean that those lenses don't resolve higher resolutions. That just means that they stamped a badge on it to get you to buy it and now they have to deal with the repercussions. Um, so for most manufacturers, when they're referring to the, the quality of a lens, uh, and they say that it's 4k compatible, usually they're saying it will resolve 4k. Uh, and it's just misleading because they're not giving you the actual size of that 4k imager, but it has become not uncommon 
for these manufacturers to say, this lens covers 8K or it covers 5K and they'll specify a camera. Usually they'll say, you know, covers 8K Monstro or covers 5K, 6K, whatever the specific camera is. So in terms of coverage, that is far more important than the resolving power, in my opinion. Um, maybe you have a lens that doesn't resolve fantastically. That doesn't mean it's just going to give you a black image. It's still going to work. It's still going to give you an image and you're going to probably have a very nice image. But if you have a lens that doesn't cover, that's a problem. Then you have that porthole effect and you're going to have a giant vignette or, uh, or at least a, a, a taper in your illumination in the corners. Um, so as far as choosing lenses for large format, for the most part, we're talking about coverage. Yeah, and Matthew, you touch on something there that imperfections, quotes, aren't always ugly. They lead to one of the more beautiful aspects of different types of lenses. This is why you make these choices. So Roy, I want to talk about, this is just my perception, maybe you can help me out here, on what a large format look is. I spent a little time last night thinking about this. And so this is how I would define it. Say your T, 2.8 on a full frame, uh, large format camera leads to just a wonderful out of focus background, very soft, you know, out of focus area. Whereas on super 35, you might need to shoot all the way wide open to get that similar look. Um, Matt, Matt, and then Matt, you tell me if I'm further confusing it, but that's just my, again, my perception. I also would say that on larger formats, your in focus subject to me seems to pop out. There seems to be more separation from the background. It almost feels like a, a little more 3D to me in a strange way. And again, a lot of this is subjective, but Roy, what, what do you think? Can we define from the cinematographer side what a large format look is at all here for the people? It's a, it's a matter of uh, what tools you're using and how you're interpreting those tools to, to get the desired effect. When we used to shoot 65 millimeter, our normal taking lens was around an 80, 85 millimeter lens. So that would give you a full figure shot and the background would fall off based upon your stop. So that would give you that dimensionality you're discussing, um, that sense of uh, uh, 3D. Uh, my, my issue with principally all of this is that Manufacturers will, will deliver something and they'll call it whatever they want. But it's my job to try to, to break through the confusion with the producer or the director who's bought into this and believe that if there's only one camera you can use or one set of lenses or, or uh, one, one type of anything. And it, you know this is all black art. I mean, whatever you want to call it, it's a black art and it's based upon our interpretations. And even in, in Matthew's world, it, it can be somewhat subjective uh, uh, because every lens has an aberration. But I contend that a lens is only as good as the sensor uh, that's capturing it. And uh, so it's, it's a tool uh, and what you choose to call it, what you choose to do with it is your interpretation because you're still the person pushing the button. And uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, the issue that I find mostly is this right here is, is this, uh, what do we call it? I mean, VistaVision is a, a 35 millimeter uh, horizontal um, uh, motion picture film. And, uh, you know, to call it, call uh, a red camera, VistaVision cameras, kind of for me, a person that owned four VistaVision cameras and shot quite a bit of VistaVision, uh, that's kind of a misnomer. So I think that it's all good because it, they're catchphrases and it's all what, Cine, what the Cine Alta was when we first started shooting with the 900. And I thought it looked gorgeous, but you know, and I had Panavision glass uh, and uh, uh, plus eight camera and we thought it was gorgeous, but truthfully now, now looking back on it, I, we beat up those lenses pretty badly because they, they were not able to do what they were designed to do. And uh, uh, so again, it's, you know, being an artist instead of a scientist, it's my job to sort of interpret and sort of be a, a therapy uh, uh, to, the, uh, to the artist that, I, that I'm surrounded with to convince and persuade and, 
and calm down this whole exaggerated fear over what tool we're using. I mean, even during the motion the days of motion pictures, uh, when you're shooting film all the time, every year, every two years, Eastman Kodak came out with a new product that was better than the last last one. And we thought the last one was fine. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it was just a, a learning curve and something you did. And and that's what we're doing now. And, it, and it, you know, if you're, if you're an artist, you're not having fun with this. It's, it's time to get out of the game because it's extraordinarily uh, fun uh, to, to find new tools and uh, to, to find how you can lace them into your, your interpretation of an image. I 100% uh, agree, Roy. And, and honestly, let me pose a question to the people watching. Why attend a panel like this? The answer is, to understand what choices are available for you on your next project. Because, you know, Roy, you're up on sort of the, the latest technological developments on optics or sensor or whatever, what have you. Um, not everyone is. So to make the a thousand or so choices you need to make as a cinematographer, you need to understand large format and know that that's at least available. But you're right, many films are shot on Super 35 all the time. They look lovely, we all love them, <laughs> you know no complaints, no complaints there. And at the end of this, it should all be serving the story, right? All these choices. I, my, my issue is that I have to face those people in front of the camera. And sometimes they don't want high resolution. Sometimes they don't want something that, that shows every pore in their skin. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you're constantly, even though you're using, and I, I contend full frame is the best method of uh, approaching all of this. And at some point, everybody's going to get on the same page and decide on the terms that we really should be using instead of old, ancient motion picture terms. My biggest uh, frustration is the term LUT, which is a, a Kodak term that, that came from film uh, to set up the, the rank uh, flying spot scanner. And we still use it to this day as if it's, it's a standard that we all set, set our look to. Uh, but having been uh, mentored by Ansel Adams, uh, I believe that the image is created in the dark room and uh, that, uh, uh, you know, it's not about the things, it's about us and our interpretation. But uh, the biggest issue I think that we have to deal with is how do we take these extraordinary devices uh, with re resolving power uh, and color bit depth, make them look creamy and beautiful and, uh, and uh, keep us from getting screamed at by our, our movie stars or um, uh, embarrassed in front of the producers. And it's, that's, what we, that's what we do. And we're always hoping that, that the technologist will bring us something that's, that is as close to perfect as possible. But in my, from, my, from my point of view, I want something that's neutral, that I can count on every day to do the same thing because I'm the crazy one uh, outside uh, the box. I'm the one that's, that's uh, cheating the sensor, uh, screwing with the lenses, trying to make them do what I want them to do. Uh, I, I still use Waterhouse stops uh, in lenses and, and for, for my own reasons. But you know, I think that it's wonderful to have these tools and we need to have them, but we also have to realize that that doesn't give us a chance to step back and hide and say, well, the, the tools are making the image. They don't, they never have, and they never will. And, and I think, oh my gosh, Roy, so many things to touch on there. One, if you're not, not familiar, he said, let look up table. Um, uh, and then in terms of, do you need to see every pore on your actor's face? Do you need to shoot on the top of a mountain at T1.5? You spend all the time going up the side of the mountain and you can't see the Greek temple behind you because it's all out of focus. And, and, I, and Roy, you touch on something great there that I do think there's a tendency to hide behind the tools sometimes, behind the technology, if you're a little less sure about some other aspect of the process, whether it's working with actors or, or, or just lighting in general, basic characteristics of lighting. Um, yeah, oh, so many great points there about the uh, black art, you called it, of cinematography. Um, before we go too far though, I do wanna play a little bit of the stand trailer Roy, do you think you could set this film up a little bit for us? What types of lenses did you shoot on? What camera? Uh, could you kind of set up the trailer for us before Michael cues it? Uh, this is an interesting, uh, interesting film in that we, we had Sigma lenses throughout the picture.
but for the first three days, uh, they hadn't gotten to, to Canada yet. And so we were using uh, uh, Master Primes and, and uh, Zeiss, and we melded them together perfectly uh, with a Sigma glass. There was two points to this. It's a true story, and there were two points. We wanted to show the impoverished and the, uh, uh, the rejected uh, uh, citizens and immigrants in an isolated, cold environment that, that, that was almost black and white. Uh, and we wanted to show the, the people that uh, with uh, opulence, with, that were the decision makers. We wanted to show them in an exaggerated, uh, almost three-strip technicolor saturation. And uh, I was told that this, uh, of the uh, um, uh, black magic uh, 4.6 camera couldn't do that. Uh, and uh, I was told that the Sigmas were, were, uh, were not going to be able to do it. And that just made me really excited because I had to prove them wrong because tools are tools and you can do whatever you want with them. You can make a master prime look like a cook or a cook look like this, as long as you have a, a specific, and Michael, I know you have a bench standard for how you, you set up lenses and uh, what, uh, what you require. Well, for me, I have to have all those bench standards in my mind so that I can veer from them and be crazy. And, uh, uh, and so that's what I had. I had a camera that was neutral. I had no aliasing issues or moiety issues, which I would, and I did that on purpose. I shot through lace and everything conceivable to try, try to screw, up, screw the camera up and the lenses. And I have to tell you, well, the, the work speaks for itself. It was done very, very quickly. And, uh, um, and I'm proud of it because it's out of, maybe 500 hours of television and, and 12 feature films, uh, it, this movie has a, has a consequence. It, it means something instead of just being pablum. Great, great. So on that note, um, I'm gonna be quiet here as the Stan trailer begins to play. Again, shot on Blackmagic and Sigma Cine Prime's large format. Okay, here we go, Michael, whenever you're ready. It isn't illegal to speak one's mind in this country. Then make it illegal. If you go, Stefan Sokolowski, I'll go with you. Anywhere they send you, I'll find you, Rebecca Almozov. Stay away from that. There is a meeting tomorrow. You should come. You got this color skin, and they don't let you in no more. We all came to this new land on a promise. But the future has arrived, and the promise has not. Your brother was very inspiring. Yes, he likes to talk about rights. Just none for the women he knows. Maybe there's someone who's brave enough to Forget try about that Jewish girl in this tank. She does not want to see you. Sokolowski, welcome to the revolution. Get the damn thing stopped and clear those troublemaking foreigners right out of the country. They will crush you. I will never forget about her or the strike. The more we do nothing, the more nothing changes. Great. Um... Roy, that looks gorgeous. Musicals, crowd scenes, all of that gives me heart palpitations, but uh, it seems like you crushed it there from the trailer. I can't wait to see the feature. Thank you. Um, okay, so we have, uh, I'm gonna take a few questions here back to back. We have a question from Brian. Could we hear from Matt about how speed boosters or focal reducers compare to large format sensors with the same lens? Then Brian goes on to say, the general consensus seems to be that a focal reducer will get you the same look. What are the caveats? Uh, interesting. Does oh, you want me to take down? that Yeah, yeah, yeah. Matthew, if you could tap um, that guy. Yes and no. The, the, the speed booster you should always use with a grain of salt. First of all, the, the again, <laughs> the marketing behind them when they first came out was, uh, not when they first came out, they've been around for a very long time, but when Metabones, when the newer, uh, I'd say the more recent crop of them, you know, they used to be called a um, oh my goodness, I'm forgetting now. 
uh, 701 or 71. I can't remember. Anyway, um, their big marketing push was that it gives you the full frame look and it makes your lenses sharper. Uh, that was kind of the, the, the big myth that everyone was spreading when those first came out. It magically made them sharper and it really doesn't. So the biggest thing that you need to take into consideration when using a speed booster is, yes, it will change the actual focal length of your lens. It will give you a similar look as far as angle of view and depth of field goes, but uh, it's also going to introduce other aberrations, chromatic aberrations, spherical aberrations. Um, it could shift your focus a little bit and your marks won't be accurate. There are a lot of things to consider. Lenticular aberration as well. Yeah, yeah. So to say that it will give you a full frame look is I suppose partially true, uh, but definitely take that with a grain of salt. Uh, Matthew, do you think you could go ahead and maybe define for us a little tricky maybe without images, but angle of view versus, uh, I don't know, focal length, like what, what are you? Maybe so the angle of view, um, I, I guess we could actually just use zoom here as an example. So mm -hmm. if you're looking at Graham's shot right now, You've got, you know, his face fills the center and you've got the camera on one side with some very nice creative solutions products on there um, and a, a photo frame in the back. Uh, so that's his angle of view is, I don't know, I'm going to say 100 degrees, whatever. I don't actually know. I don't know what the distance of his camera is. But let's say it's a 100 degree angle of view. If you move the camera forward or back, the angle of view does not change. You're just changing your focus distance. If you swap out the lens to a wider focal length, you will change your angle of view up or down, depending on the focal length of the lens. If you change the format of the camera that he's using, you will change your angle of view. Um, and that's a lot of what we've been talking about here is what what defines that large format look so if graham's camera which i think you're using an fp right yeah i have an fp with a uh, 35 i series uh, okay there. perfect so right now he's shooting in full frame 35 millimeter focal length and he has whatever that angle of view is i don't know off the top of my head if graham switches to a 50 millimeter and doesn't move the camera it's going to be a much tighter field of view or angle of view um, he's going to, you're going to probably lose most of the camera and the photo frames and it'll be a much tighter shot. And now if he wants to regain that angle that he had, he would have to back the camera up. And when you move your camera back, you're losing some of that depth of field because the basics of physics is your depth of field is determined by your aperture, your focal length and your focus distance. So vice versa if he was let's say this was a super 35 camera and uh he jumped up to full frame and he wanted to maintain the same angle of view he'd have to use a longer lens uh to get back to where he was but he has not changed his distance so now his depth of field is going to be shallower so i know it's Great. a little hard to comprehend because we're not we don't have visuals necessarily um i think you did i think you did a Good job. Maybe pop into the uh, Q and A tab, um, folks out there, if, if that seemed confusing, because that's sort of fundamental to what we're talking about. So I want to make sure that everyone kind of understands that. Uh, yeah, I think that's that's absolutely view, necessary. It's, 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 angle of view is a formula um, uh, for for a particular lens, and so that's that's rather simple. I mean, you can you can either look it up in the American Cinematographer's Manual or put a camera up and and determine the angle that you're seeing. And uh, it's done in, uh, you know, uh, 100 degrees or 50 degrees or 35 degrees or whatever. And it really has, it, it's, it's, a, it's a way of if, you're, if you have to, to go onto a set and, and uh, your production designer and your director set, say, I need to see from that wall to that wall, uh, then you have to look it up in a book or use your calculator and determine what lens will do that? So you make sure that when you're there on that day for that particular shot, that you're able to deliver what that director and the production designer wants. Or you could use like a director's viewfinder, so like the Sigma FP has a director's viewfinder mode too, and make just audition different lens options on there, handing it to well, the director. One thing, I, I agree with that. The one thing I, I find that happens is sometimes 
the um, the the uh, image is not the same as what you're actually going to photograph on your camera. Um, how so? Yeah, yeah. I I guess you could do custom. Um, well, you could do different frame lines. Uh, well, so to elaborate on that real quick, the the angle of view and the field of view, which in terms of what we're discussing are interchangeable. Um, you can't really define that without defining your sensor size or your film size. So you could say, um, you know, 100 degrees, but 100 degrees on micro four thirds, as far as the focal length requirement is completely different from 100 degrees on full frame. So what Roy said is perfectly, like that's exactly what people should be doing. You sh we should, and this is never gonna happen because we've been using focal length for 100 years or more. Mm -hmm. But what we should be thinking is, okay, here's my shot. I know that I want 90 degree angle of view. I've got, I want 90 degrees and I've got this sensor, look down the, the chart and say, oh, that's a, a 35 millimeter. That's the lens I want. But instead we've all sort of been programmed and, and just sort of learned over time to think of these angles as focal length. So most people won't think of the angle that they're looking for. They'll think of the focal length they're looking for. And that's where this entire mess of crop factor comes in because they know what a 50 millimeter looks like on full frame, but then you jump to a different format and you have to think, okay, I know what that 50 millimeter looked like. So now I need to go to a wider lens to maintain that focal length, which is wrong. It's the, the angle that you're trying to maintain. Uh, and, so and honestly, this is- yeah. Production designers, uh, at least the, the good ones, uh, all uh, build their sets based upon a particular angle of view. Uh, they use the angle of view far more than I do uh, <laughs> because I'm an interpreter. I, I, I'm not a, it's not about building, constructing something and then realizing that the audience will never see 80% of what, what you've built because the lens won't capture it. Um, so that's production designers and, and construction foremen uh, will definitely use a field of view because that if they want to see their their set as they they per, perceive it should be seen they must know what lens is required for that and that it is possible so a lot of times in their drawings you, you'll see the field of view they'll plot it on their their uh, uh, blueprints and and uh, plot the the field of view for for that set and um, I just want to touch on something here just as a general uh, macro note is if it seems like there's a lot of variables here, a lot of onset decisions that you're making, this is why cinematographers tend to live in, at least for me, Roy, I don't want to speak for you, specific camera systems, depending on how much prep or testing time I have, I'm trying to remove variables. I kind of know the look I'm going to get from this type of Alexa or this type of Sigma FP. Now, now for me, I don't always have weeks of prep time. So I'm trying to remove um, all of those. So I'm just gonna know, right? Because I've been using a similar system. One of the great things about the Sigma Cine Primes, alluding to something Roy, you said earlier, is it is a neutral kind of sharp edge to edge look. It's a good starting place for an image that you can adapt in kind of any different direction. It doesn't, um, have, it doesn't have its own personality. Uh, the artist is the personality. The lens is a, a beautiful tool to capture or render what your interpretation is. I mean, there are some extraordinary lens systems that will deliver a buttery look or give you a, a deep, uh, sharply detailed uh, image. Uh, but what if you don't want that? Yeah. I, so I, I agree with you, but I also work with a number of different studios and a production manager or a studio will have a particular set of tools that they, they want and they have to have. And so, it's been sort of my pleasure to be able to go on those journeys and find out how to to meld that those tools and to the interpretation that the director and I uh, have. So I, I I love that, but I I do like the safety of uh, mm -hmm. of having bulletproof tools that I know are going to replicate exactly the same thing every time. I 100% agree. I might be more risk adverse. I like 96 tools that I've used for years and years and one tool that I'll change for number 97 on the given project. But anyway, um, I have a good question here from Matthias from YouTube. 
could be Matthias. Um, would be interested to hear your thoughts about autofocus in cinema lenses. AF is getting better and better and can be very useful in many situations. Of course, not all. This is a great question actually, which, uh, br and this also ties in with another question I, I have, which is Graham, what is the, the rig behind you? So if you don't mind Roy and Matthew, I'm gonna talk about this a little bit. So this is the Canon C500 Mark II. This is a full frame. I actually, yeah, so this is a 5.9K sensor, 38.1 by 20.1 millimeter. Um, of course, it's a CMOS sensor. And it's rigged up here with a bunch of wooden camera stuff and also the Teradek RT system. So where I'm going with the autofocus question is actually to this TOF1 rangefinder directly behind me, which allows autofocus on cinema lenses. Now I want to say you have to be careful with that because out of the top one, you're getting an infrared beam that hits a space about, you know, yay big. So as long as your subject is in that part of your frame, it's communicating to your cinema lens through the Teradek RT ecosystem. Uh, you know, my subject is here, keep this in focus. So you have to do a little bit of correction for offset, things, things like that. So, so yes, autofocus is possible specifically on cinema glass. However, if your subject is sort of crossing frame like this, you know, you might, you might not want to have autofocus engage in those situations, but steady cam, one or down a hallway, interviews, things like that. And of course, one of the cool things about the top one as well is that it's putting an overlay onto your small HD monitor showing distances. It's really, there's two lines you need to line up. Okay, you're in focus, you're not in focus. Uh, I can't show the overlay right now, but maybe someone from the CS Presents uh, team can pop a link into, uh, into the comments just about the top one and autofocus in general. Um, more generally about autofocus in cinema, Roy, do you have a theory on that? I try, I, I tend not to use it too much personally, but do you have a, do you have any situations where ever? Well, the, the greatest assistants I've ever used, yeah. um, uh, they fly in the dark. Uh, they, yeah. they, they, since they triangulate everything, uh, but most of them have a, a, a focusing system that will give them their, their space in the uh, ozone where, where the characters stand. Because if you understand, the greatest assistants uh, don't pull their tape out for, for every mark. They, they uh, use their brain and their triangulation from the camera and the subject to interpret where they should be on the lens. And, I've worked with some assistants like in Canada, Jason Clute, who we were shooting anamorphic wide open, which is, I don't recommend at all, but it was something the director <laughs> wanted to do. And, uh, uh, and he was in focus the entire feature. And, uh, uh, and you know, Panavision's got a great system. This looks like it's a great system. It's a, it's a great crutch to make sure that you can ass uh, assure yourself that you are where you should be. But if you use it in, in theatrical feature films uh, or, or television, no actor ever hits their mark necessarily, nor does anything happen as it should be. So it's, it's just another tool that helps you to find where you are within the ozone. I mean, many people use light meters for the same reason, because it, it's, it's a tool. It's something that will give you uh, your place within that, that, that frame and know where you are. And uh, if you use it as something that's robust and it's always going to be right, uh, you're, you're, you're not being fair to the tools that you have because they're, they're not built for that. They're built to give you a, a safety factor to know where you are. Exactly. Yeah. So just with range finders, you know, like the top one, I pop it in and out of uh, autofocus potentially situationally, depending on what's going on. But um, as Roy said, you know, I, I get to work with great ACs. So does he. I mean, they, they do their their devil magic and it all works out as well. So perhaps I'm not the one who should comment on that. But we have a question from Owen here. If you had to choose, oh, this is a tricky one. If you had to choose one focal length and one lens, uh, a one lens to shoot a dramatic production on the digital camera, such as an Ursa, which lens would you use and why? Let's just make this a, a quick round table. I mean, 35, I guess. <laughs> what do you guys think? Oh, he man. To 29, 27. 27? He, yeah, uh, you do close-ups. I, mean, I was doing Quantum Leap. Well, we use that lens more than any other lens, and we could come into here uh, uh, with a, a big, giant close-up, and the background would be in focus. 
And that was wonderful. It was just, it was, it was like uh, doing split diopters. It was like, uh, you know, having huge depth of field, but it was the, the 27 millimeter lens. And if I had only one lens, that would be the lens I'd probably want. All right, note for the Sigma team, make a 27. Matthew, pick one lens, real easy, right? Yeah, right. Um, I hate to sound like a broken record, but this is exactly the problem I'm referring to. I couldn't possibly choose a focal length without knowing the format because a 50 millimeter on a, a you know, a eight by 10 camera is completely different from a 50 millimeter on micro four thirds. So you give me a format and I'll tell you the lens, but for the sake of argument and sounding like I'm beating a dead horse, let's assume we're talking about full frame. Uh, and for me, that's, I couldn't possibly, I mean, that's like asking me to pick my favorite child. Um, you don't have to do it. You don't loosely, have to do it. Loosely, loosely, loosely. Okay. I would say 50 and maybe a 65 millimeter would be in the contending there. I've been tinkering with the new, I, it's a, you and I both sound like we're plugging Sigma here, but the 65 <laughs> millimeter I series is pretty fantastic uh, for Super 35 or APS-C. 35 millimeter all the way hands down no question great okay uh we forced you to pick a favorite child there and you nailed it uh thank you owen for that palm sweater of a question um okay so anonymous attendee asked does full frame need better dynamic range uh okay so this is kind of a program programmatic software side of things matthew i see you nodding How uh I, yeah i there's a very specific i'm not a camera expert but yep. i will from my limited knowledge of cameras, I will say that dynamic range, you know, software things aside, dynamic range is for the most part uh, tied to pixel size, you know, and how well they can keep the noise down and everything. So again, you can have a full frame sized sensor and have it be 12 megapixels, or you can have a full frame sensor and have it be, sorry, let me stick with, Ks. You can have a full frame 4K sensor, or you can have a full frame 12K sensor. The pixel density on that 12K sensor is going to be much higher than the 4K. So in theory, you're going to have a much harder time keeping that dynamic range high on a, a more tightly packed sensor. So technically, it's tied to the sensor size, but it's more importantly tied to how tiny your pixels are, which varies on every format and every resolution. So I have a problem with dynamic range mm -hmm. and how it's used. Uh, dynamic range, every camera allegedly can, uh, can can hold 15 stops of dynamic range. Allegedly, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> but I have a question. How is that measured? Is it measured with as a reflective, um, uh, uh, like the zone system, or is it me measured with an incident meter? Uh, also, how many stops are, do we have between one and uh, 22. So you base, using that, you can put the, the, uh, the, the iris on anything and that's gonna hold 15 stops of, of range, but that's not true because if you're wide open, there's only one camera I know that can bring most of that uh, clipping information back into the image. There's only one and the rest of them don't do that. So it's, it's a total misnomer and nobody for a minute should believe any of that because it's not true. There's too many subjective things they're not telling you about how they're measuring the, the, the dynamic from pure white to, to satin black. And uh, uh, it's just, uh, uh, I think that it's for all of us. And one of the things I do on every project I do uh, is to shoot a, di a dynamic range test at, at different stops uh, to see how much I hold in the highlights and how much I hold in the shadows. Uh, it's it, it, in pre-production, it's a formula. When I'm in production, it's in my eye. I, it, I, I don't think of uh, ratios at all. But dynamic range is a dangerous, dangerous thing because if you go out and you think that you're going to hold 15 stops wide open, you, you're really gonna get, be, be uh, heartbroken. Roy, I'm, I'm really jealous of your, your bells sound effect that happens every time you drop a truth bomb. So hats off to you for, for that. But, but yes, I mean, you're alluding to marketing speak versus the reality. So test, test, test. 
don't believe what's on the box unless the box is from a creative solutions company and then, then they crush it. But in general, make do your own testing with everything that you do before you go into the field. Um, Brad Baker from Facebook asks, this is one I feel like is for you, Matthew. When you talk about resolving the image, can you explain the issues related to focusing on large format sensors and using older or uncoated lenses? Okay, a few things there. Uh, so that's another topic. Every topic here is debated. This is sure. all. Yeah. <laughs> um, Cue the bells so, sound of, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the resolving power of a lens is, a, it's an analog um, measurement, whereas the resolution of a camera is a very digital, it's a very hard number. Um, it's, it's not, you know, it's strictly a number of pixels and the size of those pixels. When we measure the resolving power of a lens, we're usually measuring them either in line pairs per millimeter um, on our test projector uh, or even using a focus chart with the correct targets, or we're talking about MTF curves and the, the modular transfer function. So the, I would say the more useful um, tool in this case would be line pairs per millimeter. So when we test the lens, our ideal resolution for a good lens is 200 line pairs per millimeter, which if you very simply break that down, you have one millimeter, you know, tiny, tiny millimeter, think of a millimeter, and you fit 200 pairs of lines in that millimeter. That's the resolving power of a good lens. That's a really simple way to break it down. It's a really simple way to visualize that resolution of a lens. And it uh, has a lot to do with where you are, if you're in the center of that, that lens or on the sides of the lens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. The, that, will, that, that will change, Roy's exactly right. When we talk about that resolving power, we always specify X number of line pairs in the center and then X number of line pairs in the field, which is usually a corner. Um, uh, and it will almost always change unless you're talking about a really, really well engineered lens, but that's not common. Um, so what was the rest of that question? I don't see that one here. I might have gotten um, off. That's all right. I don't have it here. It was, um, oh, go, something about how oh, it yeah. pertains. That's okay. I'll pop that question back in if you feel like we didn't answer any part of that. I need to grind through a few questions here. Um, so let's see. Um, Roy, what, what specific Blackmagic camera did you shoot stand on? Do you remember? What is it? The Ursa? The, the, it was the G1 is what we started with. Uh, and then it was the G2, um, and uh, uh, that was the secondary thing. And, and I, the reason I chose to do that that way, first of all, I discovered that, that it was one of the only cameras I'd ever seen that could, it could be, uh, exposure could be in the clipper and it'd be pure white on the screen, and you could bring it back into, into a, a, a serviceable image. And I shoot wide dynamic range. Uh, I, I, I shoot, uh, um, uh, I, I always cheat the sensor. I don't, I don't give it what it's supposed to have. Uh, so that uh, that's part of my, my interpretation of, of my work is I will not give, you know, I, I freak everybody out when they look at scopes because it, it doesn't look like it should be. But on that, on stand, there was no noise reduction used at all uh, in, in production or in post. And we used an OLPH uh, filter uh, for the uh, the interlace and moye, uh, but uh, uh, the reason I frankly did is I'm so sick and tired of seeing young people going out and, and spending $150,000 uh, for a camera system or $100,000 for a lens system, and within a year they're having to sell it. Uh, when I started in the 60s, in the 1960s, in order to compete against the, all the great cinematographers, I had to own my own camera and my own lenses. Well, we're back to that today. A lot of young people are having to do that. And I want to say, it's about you. It's about you. The tools will service you. Uh, uh, manufacturers are not trying to skimp or cheat. Uh, they want to get your business. And you don't have to 
determine whether you want to buy a camera or a house or get married. Uh, uh, you can you can make great decisions on whatever to tool you. I was forced to use an iPhone to reshoot uh, a scene from Nightmare on Elm Street to see what it would look like. And uh, it's on YouTube. Uh, it's not something I, I would like to do, but I did it for a purpose. It's just a test. And again, it's about you and the tools you choose and what you can afford. Make sure you're telling, making a great movie first and then get as, the best equipment you can possibly have. And the, the one thing I loved about Hollywood was that we all worked together. We all somehow found a way of helping each other get to where we needed to be in order to make the images that we needed to make. Well said, well said. Um, no bells. <laughs> no bells, no bells. <laughs> um, uh, Rafa asks, where do you see Super 35 in the next five years? Oh, interesting. Here we go. Um, the, yeah, some fu futuristic stuff that in five years we're all going to be held to. Um, I, 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 I can tell you, it's not gonna be there. Really? No. Oh. Oh, Roy. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, You've done it. They had to re rebuild the anamorphics in order to, to create a two to one anamorphic instead of a two five five to one anamorphic. Uh, the full full frame uh, is the future um, because when you when you're working, uh, the director tells you, "I want I want this size, and that's it. That's what I want." Then they go into the edit bay and the director says, you know, I'd love to have a slow zoom in at this. And what happens? You start building noise and grain or, 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 or whatever. And you're stuck. You mean like a That's digital cool. zoom? I'm sorry, a digital zoom? Yes, a digital uh, zoom. Right. Or they'll change the, well, they'll change the, uh, uh, the size of, of the image. It's one of the things I love about the 12K. It's the 12, you, you don't, there's no system to show the 12K, but you have all that, that detail to make it, uh, uh, 2K, 4K, 1080P, whatever you want it to be, within that within that uh, that sensor, and I, I know that's a Super 35 sensor, but it's got a great many more pixels. And the, the way that they've cheated the resolution issue is by uh, also uh, la layering white clear pi pixels amongst all those uh, those uh, uh, tiny, I think it's 0.3 millimeter uh, uh, pixels. Uh, that are crushed together. So for me, it always comes down to you want to narrow the field, flatten the field of whatever you're doing. Everybody uses the same microphones. Everybody uses the same lights. Everybody uses the same lenses, the same cameras, because they want to simplify that part of their journey. Mm -hmm. Because when you're a director of photography on the floor, you're in the middle of battle and uh, you want to make sure that you can count on all the tools that you've got. And Super 35 was a way to get us to a higher resolution image. But Super 35 was a poor man's, what used to be called poor man's cinemascope. Uh, mm -hmm. it, was, uh, it was built, uh, it was a 1.78 1, 1. to one ratio or near that. And that's what VistaVision was. And uh, uh, that was the reason it was done because they couldn't build the, the large size sensors that we're have, we have now. So I'm thrilled about uh, large, large format. Uh, to me, build it bigger, build it bigger and bigger because I want to be protected in post-production because I have no choice. I can't say you're not doing that to my image. Uh, I want to make sure that I give the best, as Ansel did uh, with his own system, I want to give the best negative I can uh, to, uh, to uh, the owners of the asset so that I can be proud of, of, of what I've done. Mm. And if they change the, uh, the, the, the size of the image or, or any of those things, I have a safer chance of getting a better picture with a full frame uh, sensor than I do with a Super 35. I, I, I think they should go away. Okay, interesting. So also you're being a, a team player with Post here too, which I you like to, to hear. Be, Usually it's like... like well, yeah, um, that could be a whole other presentation. Gentlemen, I want to go another 10 minutes here, if, if that's okay. But I also want to note that on March 4th, 2021, Roy said that S35 was going to be dead in five years. <laughs> Let it be written. So, so five years. within five, whatever the time span is. So Matthew, when is S35 dead? Uh, okay, so <laughs> I'll start by saying I agree entirely with Roy on the benefits of, um, you know, the ability to digital zoom and 
not introducing unwanted noise as a result of those digital zooms and having that flexibility. <clears throat> I think that's an absolutely fantastic future for cinematography. Um, however, being a lens geek, I don't see the last 100 years worth of super 35 format lenses being tossed aside. Um, I think personally, and maybe I'm biased because I'm a lens geek, that the, the absolute gold mine of vintage lenses will drive super 35 moving forward. Um, you know, you take all of these lenses that everybody loves, the, the Koas and the super speeds and practically any motion picture zoom lens, um, K35s, even though those are kind of full frame anyway, um, all of these super 35 format lenses, they, they simply won't work on full frame cameras. And it's my opinion that the, the popularity of these vintage lenses will keep Super 35 relevant for mm. the foreseeable future. Um, that said, I do think that full frame will become <clears throat> the standard. I think that it will be widespread across cinema, just as it is with stills. Um, I, you know, look at, look at the camera, look at the stills world. Um, Denny Claremont used to always say, you know, he used to attend all these photography trade shows because whatever happens in the world of photography trickles down to cinematography. And the fact that you can still buy an APS-C Canon or Nikon or Sony, uh, that's not going to go. I really don't think it'll go away. But I do think that full frame will be more prominent over the next couple of years. Oh, that's also, sort of, also, also mentioned special effects. Uh, the special effects world loves the large large format uh, because they they have more power to manipulate uh, their image within within that uh, sphere. Well, uh, yes and no. I think that's that's very important. That's relevant. But like you were just saying with the Black Magic, that's 12K and it's only Super 35. So you have that that ability to manipulate doesn't come from the format. It comes from the resolution. And if the camera manufacturers can and the pixel size. Right. Well if, well, if they can continue to pioneer and make those, you know, let's say you get the same dynamic range, the same noise performance, everything's the same on a Super 35 12K sensor, there's not really a whole lot of benefit to go to full frame. Um, the other tidbit that I think is important for full frame compared to Super, Super 35 and, and beyond full frame is that 35 millimeter full frame, VistaVision, whatever you want to call it, is kind of the sweet spot as far as the laws of physics go in terms of lenses. So beyond full frame, let's say 65 format or medium format, whatever you want to call it, you run into the laws of physics and you cannot make lenses currently. Maybe we're going to figure that out soon. Uh, but you cannot make lenses faster, meaning you can't have a faster T-stop or a faster aperture than you will get on most full frame lenses. So at a certain point, your your benefits go up and up and up shooting full frame. And when you get to a larger format, such as 65, those benefits start to either plateau or go down. So you'll have something like, you know, you can have a 50 millimeter F 0.95 on full frame. It's there, it's doable. It's been done many times, but you'll never see that for medium format. It's just not possible, at least not within reason. Um, sorry, let me clarify. It's very possible. It's not practical. You'd have a trash can sized lens. Um, so at a certain point, we will become bound by the laws of physics and it will just not be attractive to shoot on larger formats than full frame. Great. Um, uh, so, uh, pivoting back to something, Roy, you said, I have a question from Victor here. Okay, this is kind of this is uh, could be a topic for an entire panel. So, so keep that in <laughs> mind. Maybe we can tackle this in a pithy way. But isn't that a DP's nightmare that some hack will change the image in post a generation later? Um, uh, this is me alluding to you saying you were very you know team player with with the post house. So the argument here is burn the image in as much as possible, or give them a very you know gradable print that they can do whatever they want with at twelve k. 
Well, if they can do it to Alan Davio, they can do it to me. Uh, and, uh, you know, ET has now got, got digital effects where there were, were no digital effects. Takes away some of the charm of what was, was uh, Alan's uh, vision for ET. I, I don't agree with that at all. But we, we are in, in a, a business of commerce. And uh, you can be the staunch advocate and say, it's my way or no way. But what I found out is that, that if I... If I partner with people that trust me, if I partner with people that see me as a part of the team uh, throughout the entire process of making a film, I personally think pre-production is the most important uh, period in, in making films. And you build on that relationship and you create that security and sense of, of uh, reliance on each other so that when you do get into post-production, uh, you, you can uh, reinterpret with them. I mean, I, I've never not been allowed, even on CSI, which was pretty crazy, I've never not been allowed to be a part of the post-production process. Uh, if, if the producers try to keep me out, the colorist will bring me in. And it's because they know that, I, that I'm, I, I'm a voice of reason. Mm. And uh, that, that's the thing. Being an artist, you can't call yourself an artist. Somebody else has to call you an artist. And uh, <clears throat> it's this is a world of, uh, of commerce and we have to work within those parameters. And I personally contend that being a cinematographer is, is one uh, tenth uh, uh, percent of, uh, uh, of technology. It's uh, 35 or 40 percent of uh, expression and the rest is therapy. Being, being a, a, a therapist to all those that surround you because an actor wants to, to, to know that, uh, that, that, you, that you can be trusted. Mm -hmm. I've, uh, Harry Stradling told me, put a piece of glass in front of the, the lens so when the act, actor looks up at the, at the lens, they'll to do their makeup and check everything, that they'll, oh, you, I trust you. you, you have something on. Even though you know that you don't need that, you just have a piece of glass up there, they, they, they feel like it, they, they can trust you. And the directors are the same way. The directors, uh, it's a very proprietary, uh, relationship. I mean, a director wants to make sure that they're the author of those images, and it's your job to service those. Now, if I if I really wanted to be an autocrat, I would do what I do every day of my life when I'm not working, and that's go out with a camera, with my Leica, and with the FP, and uh, and shoot with Leica M6. I shoot film with the FP. I shoot digital, and uh, uh, and that's where I am. The author of everything. I can do what you're suggesting. Nobody touches or changes. But here's the issue that you got to be very careful with. I, if they give you that authorship, make sure that you really know what you're, what you're authoring. Because there's times where I've been in post-production where the colorist has found something was far better than what I found. Um, uh, or the, the director said, what, what, I, what are we doing this for? Why don't we do that? I mean, it's it's... It's a wonderful journey if you allow it to be. And, it, and I learned this from Conrad Hall. It's always about the happy accidents, journeying down this, this path of a place you don't want to go, you know you shouldn't be. But when you get there, you go, wow, look at this. I never thought about this. And you know, it's working on not technocracy, but on instincts. And if you work on instincts, you will discover at the same time the audience discovers what your images mean. I mean, you touch on a few things there, Roy, is that the person on the other end in post may not be a hack. They could also be a genius. <laughs> they could be right. phenomenal. And the, if, if people take one thing away, along with, I hope, a lot of information about large formats, is there's a reason that Roy's had a career that spanned decades. It's because of that mentality. Years. Yeah. Four years. Pick the hills that you're going to die on. Seriously. Um, <laughs> I mean, right there, it will lead you to a long-term career. Okay, so we only have another minute or two here. So Matthew, I'm going to leave you with the uh, with the last question, if you don't mind. Just a general one. Next five years, not in terms of S35 or, or full frame, where do you think we're headed just on the, the lens side? Do you think the future is just more manufacturers offering sort of tunable options in the sense that you're just picking your favorite characteristics, you know, and, and you're just getting that lens? Is it more like the Sigma classics where they're introducing more quote imperfections or flares or what have you, uh, more coding. 
what do you think? What does the next five years look like for you in the world of optics? Um, very hard to say. Right now, the trend is still vintage. It's still uh, character. But at the same time, you have the exact opposite. People still want the cleanest, best, sharpest. And, and there's a, a, a camp for both of those. There's reasons for both of those. Neither is right or wrong or better or worse, in my opinion. Um, I think the future is more acceptance. And for lack of a better phrase, sort of the, the good enough um, mentality where a lens is, it's okay, but it's good enough to shoot this project. I think that the, the diehard sharpest possible feat of engineering is, is fading, um, sadly a little bit. Uh, the, the tunable thing I'm very opinionated on. I think it's fantastic. I think it's, it's clever. It's cool. I don't think it's a sustainable business model because the whole purpose there is you're you, as a cinematographer, you're looking for a lens that has a look baked into it. And that's your signature look. And that's very cool. I, I, I like that idea. I like that concept, but at the point that let's, let's say, you know, your whatever lens company, let's say Sigma makes tunable uh, prime lenses and Roger Deakins shoots film XYZ and he has this, the, these lenses tuned to this specific look. Well, that means everybody else out there can get the same look because they can tune them the same way he did. And all of a sudden your unique look is not unique anymore. Everybody has the Deakins look and all of a sudden it's just, it's fair game. It's open. So uh, I think that there is some degree of art that has to be included there. There's some degree of mad science where, you know, those cinematographers that want a unique look, you can't go buy it from Walmart. You have to create it. You have to, you have to engineer it yourself. Um, and it's not just lenses. It comes in with lighting and, and framing and all of this. I mean, Roy will know better than most that the lenses are just one tiny piece of that puzzle. Filtration, you know, I can go on and on. Um, so the tunable, stop t stop of the lens mm -hmm. yeah yeah so the tunableness i think it's a really cool feature i think it's uh it's really nice you see that from um tribe seven and a little bit from ingenue now with your new optimo primes um i don't know that it's a sustainable feature i think it's cool to have right now so we'll see uh and then obviously everyone always brings up autofocus i have tons of thoughts on that i don't think that that's going to be a mainstay for for what I will say motion picture, you know, the art of motion picture. I think autofocus is brilliant depending on the type of content that you're shooting for wedding stuff, for, for corporate videos, for music, video, that, that type of stuff. Sure. Autofocus is going to work its way into cinema lenses and it's going to be a little more common, but for cinematography, no way that you can never replace a skilled AC. So I don't think that's the future in cine lenses. Uh, yeah, because you're programmatically replacing a storytelling device that cinematographers have. So you want to be careful with that. You're focusing on what you want the audience to look at. Right, right. You and don't a, want to leave uh, that to a computer 100% right. of the time. If you're on a 600 millimeter lens and someone's running towards you, it's certainly wonderful to have a tool that will make, you, right. make you feel like you're within the ballpark. But it's you true. still have to rely on that technology. So it, it's handy in something like, you know, motorized setups when you could say, okay, at point A, it's focused here. And at point B, it's focused here. Go. That makes perfect sense. And I completely get it for that purpose. But for that dramatic, organic, when you're trying to breathe life into a motion picture, you have to have an AC. You have to have somebody pulling focus that knows what they're doing and can nail exactly what you're supposed to be focused on. Well, gentlemen, thank you so much for killing a little over an hour here with nerdy lens and sensor talk. I really appreciate it. Roy Wagner, Matthew Duclos. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Um, all right. So that's it for us. I know I didn't get to all of the questions here today. Luckily, specifically, Matthew Duclos is, is very active all over so, uh, social media uh, at Duclos Lenses, I believe is where you can hit him up for additional questions or a member of his 
team, uh, those, they're very responsive and they're all over the various uh, social platforms answering questions. I see that all the time. So thanks again to Creative Solutions and Sigma Cine USA for helping to make this event possible. Um, you can go to cs.inc to sign up for upcoming webinars, be part of that live audience for Q&A uh, sessions. You can also enjoy recordings of past conversations there uh, as well. Don't forget to keep an eye on your email that you registered with in case you were the lucky winner of the 18 to 35 art. Reminder, you gotta be in the US, you gotta be over 18. We have another CS Presents stream coming up on March 25th at 10 a.m. PST about shooting in hostile environments. We'll be talking dock shooting and riots as well as extreme weather. And we'll even touch on shooting in radioactive environments like Chernobyl with our panel. Keep an eye out for the event bright for that. Two of our four panelists have shot at Chernobyl, which is a strange fact to throw out there. Um, as a friendly reminder, please subscribe to Teradek's YouTube channel. It's a vote to keep doing these things. Really appreciate it. You can, uh, as I said, uh, find past sessions there. Um, that's it. Thanks again, everyone. Stay safe, stay healthy out there. Have a good rest of your day. Bye, everybody.